I am going to read Psalm 133, just as an introduction, maybe, to the sermon for today. So. Psalm 133, hear the word of the Lord. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. May he bless it to your hearts immensely this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Would you uh, pray with me as we begin this morning? Father, I'm so thankful that in every trial we can say that the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. We can confess in full faith that the Lord sees, the eyelids of the Lord test the sons of men. We can rejoice in the fact that in every situation, Lord, you are righteous. You love righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold your face. We love those realities that you've made known to us in the scriptures, Lord, and and we are so grateful that you've given us of your spirit and you've made us new in the name of Christ Jesus so that we're able to not only see those promises in scripture, but we're able to own them as promises that you've given to us personally. Lord, I thank you for being born again. I thank you that you did not leave me where I was Thank you that you took me out of all my rebellion against you and you gave me a heart to love you, to hate my sin, and to love your people. God, I pray that we would rejoice in the good things that you've done in our lives this morning, even as we are faced with very difficult challenges as a church body, at least one difficult challenge. Lord, help us rejoice in being born again to a living hope, imperishable, undefiled, that will not fade away, one that's being kept, an inheritance being kept for us in heaven, who by your grace are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last days. In this we are to rejoice, though now, if necessary for a brief time, we are afflicted by various trials. Lord, we know that these trials will only prove the genuineness of our faith in you and will result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that's what we wait for. That's what we long for. And until that day comes, Lord, we pray that you would give us grace to sojourn on and to keep walking in faith, waiting upon your grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, Full disclosure, it was my intention until about 11 o'clock yesterday to move on in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 5, which I know many of you are longing for me to do, and I understand that. I I get that. I'm longing to be back to the Gospel of John uh, exegetically as well. Um, but yesterday, um, around 11, 11.30, I just found it very difficult to engage with John with all my heart this morning, and I felt that I would be doing a disservice to you and dishonoring the Lord by trying to preach that passage with a, 
with as clear of a mind as I need to have in order to preach what John 5, 16 through 23 is revealing to us. So I'm, I'm sorry, but as of yesterday afternoon, midday, I, I did feel the need to go where I believe the Spirit is urging me to go this morning. And um, right now, we as a church body are walking through a very grievous and challenging situation. And it, what's most unfortunate about it is that it's a most unnecessary, grievous, and challenging situation. I, I, I feel the urgency this morning to make sure that we are all as clear as we can be on how God's Word tells us to handle matters like this. Maybe I want to start this morning with some encouragement. I feel like we, we could all use a little encouragement, right? It's medicine for the soul. Let me give you four encouragements relating to uh, conflict and sin as it manifests within the church. Kind of strange to say that conflict and sin within the church can be encouraging. Now, let me give you four reasons why. Number one, conflict is inevitable in the church. The, the combination of our remaining sinful natures with various opinions and convictions that we all hold on matters along with the scheming of Satan make conflict inevitable in the church. It's not a matter of if it happens, it's a matter of when it happens. And when it happens, the question that we must answer is simply this, how does the Lord want us to address it? How does the Lord want us to respond? Now that's encouraging because it means that we already know what to expect when we're talking about the nature of church life and walking together in this fallen world. We are to expect that conflict will arise. So it shouldn't shock us and it shouldn't be surprising. Number two, it's important to recognize and be encouraged by the fact the conflict is always the result of sin. Conflict in the church is always the result of sin. James chapter 4, verse 1, it says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is, it not, is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Now, when it says pleasures there, the context makes very clear that what it's talking about are sinful desires. Every conflict in the church is a result of sinful desires. And again, that's encouraging because that means we know generally what is behind every single conflict that manifests in the church. We know that there is sin somewhere in this situation. That means that for us, it's very clear what we need to do when conflict does arise in the church. We need to identify what that sin is and we need to address it. That's encouraging. We have a game plan laid out for us, right? When conflict arises, the Lord says it's because of sin. And we need to do our diligence to find out what that sin is and address it. A third encouragement. I want to try and run through these quickly so we can get into the rest of the message this morning. But A third encouragement for us is, this has a little more weight to it. Not addressing conflict swiftly puts the health of a local church body in danger. Not addressing conflict swiftly puts the health and the well-being of a church body in danger. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. If conflict is given time to fester, we're told that it will become a root of bitterness springing up in our midst and it will cause trouble and will result in many others in the church body being defiled. The longer you allow a root of bitterness to fester, to sit there and lie, the more impact that root of bitterness is going to have upon the body as a whole, and it will be a negative impact. Therefore, the encouragement in that verse is that the Lord expects us to move swiftly 
when matters of conflict and sin arise in the church that would threaten the health of the body. Number four, the most encouraging point. Conflict in the church is still accomplishing God's purposes for his church. Probably the clearest statement on this matter is from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 18 to 19, where Paul says, first of all, to the Corinthians, first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. Now, that's kind of an understatement. If you remember what Paul's already written in the earlier part of the letter, the first three to four chapters is dealing with divisions and factions that had crept up in the church. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. Well, I'm of Christ. The hyper-spiritual ones on the end, right? Like, I'm of Christ. Paul's already addressed that. It's kind of an understatement. But look what he says in verse 19. He says, in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, so that those who are genuine, those who are approved, may be recognized among you. One of the great benefits of contention and conflict when it arises within the church is that everyone in the church gets to see the difference between those who are genuine and those who are not. And that's a very encouraging thing. Conflict in the church pulls back the veil and reveals which church members are genuine and which ones are not. And so thankfully, the Lord uses even messy, contentious situations in His church to reveal those who are not true believers and to distinguish them from those who are. That's a very great reality that we must keep in mind as we walk through conflict. Now, The question that we need to ask when sin and conflict arises in the church is simple. How should we address it? Thankfully, the Lord has not, excuse me, thankfully the Lord has answered that question for us in various passages in the New Testament. And I want us to look at those passages briefly and quickly today. Um, Obviously, we're not going to have time to go into every detail in these passages, but I do hope just to point out the general guidelines that I believe will be helpful to our current situation. The first passage we should always start with is Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. Here is where our Lord lays out His process for dealing with conflict in His church. In this passage, our Lord is telling us a step-by-step, giving us a step-by-step process about what to do when conflict or sin arises among members of His church, specifically when it's instigated by sin. This is often referred to as the process of church discipline. You've heard that phrase probably before, church discipline. Uh, That's this process that Jesus walks through in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. That is generally speaking what is meant whenever we talk about the process of church discipline. From verses 15 to 17, Jesus gives four steps. A four-step process for addressing sin and dealing with conflict in his church. The first step is in verse 15 which tells us that before anything else happens in relation to a brother or sister who has sinned in the church, before we do anything else, we are required by the Lord to go to that sinning individual one-on-one and discuss the matter in private. Jesus says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between him and and you alone. There's no ambiguity in that. There's there's no question about what Jesus intends when it comes to addressing sin and conflict in the church. You go to the person whom you believe has sinned one-on-one, and you deal with that individual alone. And what that means is, we don't commit the Christian sin of going and talking to our best friends about a situation in hopes of gaining counsel on it. We go deal with the individual alone. And you understand what the purpose behind that is. It's so that you protect and guard the character and reputation of both parties involved in relation to the rest of the body. You know how much damage is done by slander and gossip and maligning someone behind their back.
Jesus could not be more clear than this. The first action we are to take when we believe someone has sinned against us is not to go glab about it with someone else. Not even under the guise of seeking counsel. No, the first step when you believe a brother or sister has sinned against you is to go address the matter with that person alone. Anything other than that enters into the realm of gossip and slander and is sinful. Leviticus 19, verses 16 through 17 makes that abundantly clear. God commanded his people, you shall not go about your people as an idol, babbler, or a slanderer. If you have an issue with your brother, you go speak to him frankly. You go deal with him directly. Lest you incur guilt. Now I know that that rubs us wrong with our tendency to be very passive aggressive. I was raised in a culture that was not so passive aggressive as Minnesota culture is. And I know that that means I rub some of you very wrongly and I'm I I really can't help that in many ways. I'm sorry. But we can't let our our, uh, fear of conflict keep us from doing what the Lord's called us to do in situations where sin and conflict are arising. We We have to be bold and courageous, and we have to have enough faith in Christ to know that what He dictates and prescribes for us to do in these situations is the wise course of action, regardless of how we feel and how our emotions would drive us. So, first step is you go deal with the person alone, individually, one-on-one. Now, if if in that process, now the the aim in that process, you notice in this verse, is so that you would win your brother or your sister. The, The aim there is not to go shame someone over something that he or she has done. It's not to go uh, heap uh, coals of accusation upon that person. It's to go win your brother to help him see what he has done wrong, to to reason with him so that at the end of the the process, you would be able both to come together and reconcile and both acknowledge, yes, that was wrong. And I'm so sorry, brother, that I did that to you. Let's move forward in peace. But where it doesn't accomplish that end, that first step, then there's a second step that we move to. That's verse 16. If we've gone to a person one-on-one and we've sought to reason with that person about a sin that we believe he or she has committed, then we move on to the second, and, and, and he or she does not listen. There's still disagreement between us. Then we move on to the second step, which is bringing one or two other witnesses into the situation in order to weigh and evaluate what's going on. Jesus says, so that, the purpose of this is so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. See, the point of bringing these witnesses in is not to bring in people who are on your side, who can stand with you and make your arguments for you. The purpose of this step is to bring in objective people who can look at the situation objectively and see who is in the right and who is in the wrong. And if they're united in that situation, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the word is confirmed, then they give their evaluation to the sinning party in hopes that they will listen to the counsel of more than just one person. Now, if that step fails, Jesus gives a third step. That's in verse 17. Where if that step, second step, still does not resolve the conflict then we are commanded by Christ to tell the matter to the church. And this is talking about appealing to the collective judgment of the whole church body on an issue. This is not talking about bringing a matter to an eldership. This is talking about bringing a matter before the entire church body so that the entire church body can weigh in on what's happened and give their collective consensus about the right path forward in that situation. Now, if this person, whoever is guilty and in sin, does not then listen to the collective counsel of the church, then there is a fourth step that Jesus gives us in Matthew 18, verse 17, which is for the church to cast the unrepentant person out of the fellowship of the body. This is often referred to as excommunication. 
Jesus says, if they won't listen to you, then you treat them as a tax collector or a Gentile. Now, there can be confusion in some minds about what Jesus means whenever he says that. It's almost as if he's saying, if they, if they will not listen to the counsel of the church, then you just treat them as all the other sinners out in the world who still need to hear the gospel and need to be converted. You just treat them like a tax collector or a Gentile, right? I mean, we, we hear that within the context of the accusations that the Pharisees brought against Jesus, right? This man eats with sinners and tax collectors. How can he fellowship with people like that? And Jesus' response is, well, I came not to save the righteous, but I came to, to call sinners to repentance, it's not, the, it's not the healthy who need a physician. It's the sick who need a physician. And that's why I've come, to deal with the sick people. When we read a statement like, treat them as tax collectors or Gentiles, we often interpret that in light of Jesus' grace and mercy towards those other sinners that we see in the gospel. Right? Those tax collectors, those sinners that he deals with. However, I don't believe that that's the intention, that, that, I don't believe that's the point that our Lord has in mind whenever he tells us to treat them as a tax collector or Gentile. What he's saying is that at that point, if this person who used to be among us does not listen to the counsel of the entire church body, the consensus of the majority, then that person is to be treated as an outsider. That's the point as one who is not in right standing with God and who has no right standing in the company of the saints. That's how we are to treat that person. And until that person manifests true repentance towards Christ and acknowledges sin and turns away from it, then the church must consider that person who has refused to repent as being outside of the kingdom of God. Now, whether or not that person is we can't actually, in reality, is outside of the kingdom of God. We cannot make that pronouncement. What we can say is that in light of how this person has behaved through this process, there's no evidence that shows us that this person belongs to Christ. There's a hard-heartedness. There's an unwillingness to acknowledge and recognize sin. There's an unwillingness to repent of that sin, even when the entire church body comes to tell him that he is in the wrong. Therefore, until true repentance manifests, we must treat such a person as being outside of Christ's kingdom. And briefly, just notice something about what Jesus says in verses 18 to 20. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want you to see something that Jesus says here that really gives weight to what's going on in this whole process of church discipline. He says in verse 20 that when the church follows this process, even if there are only two or three people gathered together in his name, Jesus says, I am there in their midst. Now that is not a statement primarily dealing with the fact that Jesus is present with all of his churches no matter where they are and no matter how few they are. That's not primarily Jesus' point. This is spoken within the context of church discipline being exercised. Jesus is saying, where two or three of you gather together in my name, where two or three of you agree about any matter upon which you've decided, heaven will answer that, that, that prayer. I will be with you in your midst. In other words, the presence of Christ is promised to be with the church who continues to work through this process of church discipline. That should be very comforting to all of us as we are currently faced with a situation where we have to contemplate these matters. Jesus has promised his presence will be with us as we seek to honor him in all that we do in this process. And then you notice verse 18. More than that, Jesus says in verse 18 that the decision that ultimately is reached by a godly, Christ-centered, God-fearing congregation that decision is actually a manifestation of the will of heaven on the matter. You see that? That what the church decides in relation to the situation of church discipline, what the church decides after it has walked through in a Christ-honoring, God-fearing manner, that decision is a manifestation of what has already been decided in heaven. 
You see what he says there? Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. The tenses of the verb make clear that whatever the church is doing on earth, it's already been determined to happen in heaven. Now that's not to say that a church can't go awry. That's not to say that a church body can't be wrong. In, in, in exercising church discipline on someone. But what it is to say is that when a church is faithfully, fearingly walking with Christ through the process of church discipline, then we can be confident that we are not acting out of, out of accord with the will of God in heaven. In disaccord or whatever, whatever word you want to put there. Now this ought to make us feel the weight of responsibility Christ has laid upon us as members of his church, but it also ought to give us hope. That as we unite together in the name of Christ and walk through this process together, we have Christ's promise that his presence will be with us in our midst and he will be leading us into the right decision. So we need to take heart. Now this passage in Matthew 18 serves as really the foundation for understanding the process of church discipline. This is like the go-to passage whenever we're trying to understand where do we begin working through a, through a situation that's difficult and involves sin within the church. However, there are some situations in which this process must be expedited for various reasons. And we find a couple of those situations listed for us in the scriptures. And I want to just mention two of them. I want to mention them to you. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 12, we find that this process of church discipline is to be expedited when the sin is so blatant and so publicly committed that the process of working through it step by step is unnecessary. You understand what I'm saying there? When a sin has been so publicly committed among a church body, then the process of investigating what has actually taken place and who is in the right and who is in the wrong is unnecessary because the sin has been openly and publicly committed. And everybody recognizes that. Now, I'm not going to read this whole chapter, but I just want to direct your attention to some of the major points in 1 Corinthians 5. You notice in verse 1, there's a member of the Corinthian church who is in grievous sin. The kind of sin that, that, that even Gentiles recognize is wrong. It's heinous to them. In verse 2, Paul expresses shock and amazement over the fact that the church in Corinth had not yet dealt with this sinning member, right? I mean, that, that, that public sin had not yet been addressed, and therefore Paul calls upon them in verses 3 to 5 to take swift and decisive action against this sinning church member. He says in verses 4 and 5 that when they have gathered together as a church, with Paul in spirit and in the power of Christ, then they as a church body are to deliver such a man over to Satan. In effect, it's the same thing Jesus is speaking of in Matthew 18. They are to treat this person as an outsider, delivering him over to his sin. And here specifically to Satan. Verse 13, you find Paul saying the exact same thing. In so doing, the church body would be pronouncing their collective judgment upon the sinning member and would be putting away that person, that evil person from their midst. Now to my point, I just want you to notice some things here. Paul does not call the church to delegate someone to go speak to the sinning member one-on-one. -on -one. Not in this situation. Not where the sin was so public and blatantly committed that Paul heard a report about it wherever he was. I believe at this point, he, well, I don't want to speak to that, I didn't study that. Wherever Paul was at this moment in history, he had heard a report about what was going on in Corinth, and it was such a report that he actually believed it was true. True enough to take action upon it. He didn't write to them investigating the matter. He didn't... Uh, call them to designate one person to go speak with this sinning member one-on-one, -on -one, nor does he exhort the church as a whole to investigate Paul's claims over and against the man's own testimony. In other words, Paul doesn't call the church to go hear both sides of the argument before they act in passing judgment upon that man. Why not? Well, because the nature of this man's sin and the openness with which it was being committed made the process of investigating the matter unnecessary. The man was blatantly, obviously, clearly in sin, and a form of that, 
and, and a form of sin at that that was even heinous to unbelievers. What a mar and what a stain on the testimony of Christ's church in the city of Corinth to allow a sinning member like that to continue to have fellowship with the people of Christ. What damage does that do to the church's testimony as a whole to the community in which it's planted? No, because, because the sin was public and so shamelessly being committed, there was only one thing to do about it. The body had to jump straight to the final stage of church discipline and cast that man out of the fellowship of the church. And you notice just briefly in 1 Corinthians 5.11, notice what it practically looks like when a person has been cast out of a church body, been delivered over to Satan. What does that look like practically? Well, verse 11, it makes very clear that what that means, in essence, is that the body is no longer permitted to keep company with that person. That means no more fellowship with that person. Right? No more golfing with that person. No more having that person over for dinner. Uh, no more emailing that person to check in just to see how he's doing. No more checking on Facebook to keep up with what's going on in his or her life. There's, there's a, 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 a break of fellowship that is required from the church in relation to a person who is under church discipline. Paul says that the church is not even to associate with someone who bears the name of a brother and yet continues living a life of sin. Now that reveals to us the full extent of what placing someone under church discipline practically looks like. It means that the church abstains from having any form of fellowship with that person at all. And I want you to notice the, the categories of sins that are included uh, in this list that Paul gives that qualify a person to be cast out of the church like this. Notice the variety of sins that qualify a person to be treated this way. It's not just sexual immorality here. Paul says it includes drunkenness. It includes covetousness, right? Boy, that's one that's overlooked in our day. A covetous person. It includes various forms of idolatry. It includes a person being an extortioner. That is, uh, committing robbery uh, against people. Um, it, it even includes, as Paul says, a reviler. A person who is slanderous and who demonstrates a tendency to abuse and malign the character of other people. That's what a reviler is. Paul says you are not even to eat with such a person. Now, why is that? Why, why is that necessary in relation to a person who is under church discipline? Is it just to be mean to that person? Is it to be vindictive over and against that person or to get even with that person for the wrong that he or she has committed? Is that the purpose here? No, not at all. The purpose behind casting a person out of the fellowship of the church in this way is so that this person who refuses to let go of or repent of his or her sin can feel in a small way what it is like to be cut off from the people of God. It is a temporal measure, a measure taken in time to give this person a sense of what it's like to be separated from the people whom God is saving to be a people for his own possession. Right? It's, it's to let them feel the bitterness and the misery of what it means to be out of fellowship with Christ and his people in hopes that that would drive this person to repentance. That they would feel the absence of that kind of fellowship and be driven to let go of the sin and to be reconciled with Christ and his people. Right. And we often think that's unloving, that's unkind, that's harsh. How can that be the right thing to do to someone? Well, Jesus says through his apostle right here that it's the only right thing to do for someone who will not let go of their sin. 
If there's a person who bears the name brother, that is a person who claims to be a Christian and in fellowship with Christ and his people, and yet will not let go of these sinful tendencies in his or her life, there's only one thing that we can do that is actually loving for that person. That is to cut that person off so that they would feel in time what it's like to be cut off from the people of Christ prior to entering into eternity. Because to be cut off from the people of Christ in eternity is to be cast into hell forever. It is to be utterly cut off from fellowship with Christ. It's to be completely divorced and severed from the blessing of Christ that's going to envelop his people for all eternity. And you let someone who will not let go of their sin continue to be a member in, the, in good standing in the church. You let someone continue on in good standing in the church who will not let go of their sin. All you're doing, all you're doing is consigning that person to an eternity of being separated from Christ because you're not forcing that person to deal with his sin. That's the issue. That's the purpose behind church discipline. Is to show the person what it's like to be separated from Christ so that that would drive them to reconcile with their brothers and sisters and be restored to fellowship. Now, and notice notice one last thing. That's what church discipline is designed to express. It pictures and foreshadows what it is like for a person to be cut off from God and from the people of God so that this person would be confronted with that reality and not enter into an eternity of experiencing that misery. But then notice also, 1 Corinthians 5, 5, the intent of allowing that sinful member to taste in a small way the bitterness of his or her sin. Yes, it's to deliver that person over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Yes, that is, that is very key. It is handing the person over for his or her flesh to be destroyed in a, in a Job-like manner. Right? We're handing that person over to be treated with misery, or to, to, to experience misery at the hand of the devil himself. But ultimately, even that is for the purpose of seeing his soul saved on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so that his spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus that we hand such a person over to experience the bitterness of excommunication. It's for seeing his soul delivered from his sin. Yes, this this is hard love, and I understand that. I get it. This is hard love. But it's still genuine and sincere love for the person. It's love that keeps that person's ultimate good and ultimate well-being in mind. It's the same love God shows us, guys. God hands us over to innumerable forms of suffering and misery. And why does he do that? So that we would taste the bitterness of the sin to which we're clinging and let go of it. And cling tightly to the Lord who satisfies the soul. So there's a time for a church body to move swiftly in dealing with a sinful member. That's when that sin is so blatant and open that there's no need to investigate the matter. It's just plain. This is sin that's been committed. Now we have to address it. This person's not repentant. However, there's another time for the process of church discipline to be expedited. And that is when sin is actively threatening the health and the unity of the body. You see this in Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. Let me just read that for you. Paul tells Titus, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man, after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped in sinning, being self-condemned. There are times when a person manifests behavior that calls for the church 
to immediately have nothing to do with that person. Paul says here that it's the case, it is that case when a person's behavior proves him or herself to be a divisive person. That expedites the process of church discipline because divisiveness is a direct threat to the church's unity in the spirit and a threat to the maintenance of our bond of peace in the name of Christ. The believers in Crete were, just to give you an idea of what, what Paul's speaking into here, the, the believers in Crete were facing challenges of many different kinds in their churches. Most of those challenges and the most dangerous of those challenges were the issues of factionalism and schisms being produced among the local church bodies. These were being created by divisive people. Those who crept into the church and sought to carve out for themselves a segment of the body that would support them. Acts 20, they, they draw out from the church a people that would be of their, for their own following. Right? That's what Paul warns the elders against in Ephesus in Acts 20. That kind of person. That's what the church was suffering from. The churches in Crete were suffering from. And that's what Paul sent Titus to deal with for these believers. Now, he reminds Titus in verse 2, he urges or, or commands Titus to remind the believers to make sure that they speak evil of no one. To make sure that they remain peaceable, that they remain gentle, that they show all humility to all men. Why? Why should they do that? Well, Paul goes on to say, because they themselves used to be foolish. They, they used to be disobedient. They used to be deceived. They used to live in malice and envy. They used to be filled with hate. And they used to, to live with hatred for one another. It was this constant, factional, contentious atmosphere in which they used to be. And yet, Paul says, but now, because of the mercy of God, when the love of God appeared, the salvation of God and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not according to our works, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us abundantly through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, what Paul's saying is, you, you need to be peaceable with one another. You need to live with one another in harmony. You need to make sure that you guard your tongue and you don't speak evil of anyone at any time because that's what used to characterize you. You used to be hateful. You used to be in malice. You used to hate one another. But when the grace of God appeared, He saved you from all of that. He poured His mercy out into your heart. He sent forth His Son to die in your place. Jesus rose again and sent forth the Spirit to regenerate you and to make you new. And He's given you that grace so abundantly. Paul says, you remind them to keep their lives in accord with that reality. To be governed by these new spiritual affections that the Holy Spirit is producing within them. That's, that's Galatians 5.16, right? You walk by the Spirit, and you will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. Uh, Galatians 5, 24, 25, somewhere in there, uh, all who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Therefore, if we've been made alive in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's what Paul's urging Titus to remind these believers to be doing in, these, in, these, in this passage. Keep in step with the Spirit who's made you alive in Christ's name. Now, what if there is someone in the church whose behavior proves that he or she is not being governed by these kinds of new affections that are produced by the Spirit of God? What is the church to do in that situation? What if this person proves to be contentious proves to speak evil of others in the church, demonstrates by his or her behavior that they are not peaceable, but they are divisive. How does the church respond to that? Well, in verses 10 through 11, the Holy Spirit tells us exactly how to handle people like that. The church is to warn and to admonish such a person once, and then, if it's needed, to admonish such a person twice. But if that contentious behavior continues, 
What is the church to do? What is the church to do? You reject that person. You have nothing more to do with that person. Why? Because that person is sowing seeds of division in the minds of everyone who will listen to him. And his divisiveness proves that he is still trapped and enslaved to malice and envy and is still filled with hatred and is hating others. That's what verse 11 tells us. In other words, if the divisive behavior remains unchecked by the warnings, it is an indication that the mercy and kindness of God has not yet taken root in that person's heart. Now, that's not a definitive statement, but it is a sign. It is a fruit that we ought to pay attention to. As Paul says, that person is warped and he's sinning. He's he's being self-condemned by his own behavior and therefore... It's so obvious what he's doing and the threat of his behavior is so dangerous to the church, he must be dealt with swiftly. The church is to avoid interacting with that person for the well-being of the rest of the church until a real change of salvation and a real change of repentance is begun in that person's heart. And that will first manifest by a repentance of the divisiveness. Now, those are, those are a couple situations where the process of church discipline is to be expedited. It's interesting that our Lord has not only laid out step-by-step processes for how to deal with contention and sin in the church. He's not only laid out certain circumstances where the process is to be uh, uh, sped up for the health of the body. But he's also given specific instructions concerning how accusations are to be brought against elders. And you see this in 1 Timothy 5, verses 19 through 20. I'm going to try to be very quick through this. Uh, I did preach a sermon on this passage in our study of 1 Timothy on December 20th, 2020. So December 20th, 2020. If you want to go listen to that and and hear me deal with this passage more fully, please make sure that you do that. It's on our website. It may be on our our YouTube channel. You're you're welcome to, to go find it there. But 1 Timothy 5, verses 19 through 20, Paul tells Timothy... Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Now, as we all know, and as it's important to remember, elders in the church are not perfect men. Amen? I will amen that. Elders in the church are are merely men. And the best of us are capable of being wrong and sinning. Um, And when that happens, they are not to be treated as holy untouchables. You know, I grew up in the South. And in the South, there's this common idea about pastors. They are the anointed of the Lord. And and touch not the Lord's anointed, right? That that phrase from uh, David's dealings with um, Saul. Well, any of you who truly knows me, who truly knows Grant, and truly knows Lauren, you know that this is not our attitude. And if you don't know that about us, you don't know us yet. Our attitude is not that we are untouchables. However, because of the nature of shepherding and what it requires an elder to do, there are certain safeguards that the Lord has put in place to protect elders from false or unfair accusations. The very fact that an elder is called to dig deeply into a person's life exposes that elder to being misunderstood, to being ridiculed, and even to being accused of of poor or bad motives. Did you know that it's the elder's job to dig into your life? And to find the skeletons in your closet? Did you know that? So when that happens, should we be offended by that? Or should we think that our elders are actually loving us? You should think that. Even though the experience of that is not very often what we feel. (laughs) 
There are, there are times when an elder is merely seeking to do his job, but someone feels that that elder has sinned. And those feelings turn into accusations, and those accusations begin to fly. And what is the church to do in a situation like that? Well, again, our Lord's given us instructions. 1 Timothy 5.19 Especially when dealing with elders, the initial posture when we hear accusations against one is, is one of uh, believing that elder to be innocent until proven guilty. Now, we live in a society where that basic tenet of law and, and justice is just being hurled out the window. Right? The, the Me Too movement, it infects everything. Right? Uh, we, but it's so contrary to 1 Corinthians 13.7 where we are to believe all things about one another. We're to hope the best in relation to each other. When we hear accusations against an elder, or even another brother or sister in the church, our immediate reaction does not need to be accepting that accusation as if it's true. Our immediate reaction, first of all, if someone's coming to you and talking to you about someone else's sin, what does your first reaction need to be? Go talk to the person. I don't want to hear it. Go talk to that person. I don't want to hear it. We covenant with one another, right? To, to, to prevent gossip and slander in the church. That's part of what that looks like. You are unwilling to hear someone criticize someone else. Especially in an elder. An elder. Yeah, we, we grab on to accusations against elders like nobody's business. I mean, it's just like, oh, Really? Oh, yeah, I totally see that. And most of that's fed by our past experiences. Most of us in this room have experienced very poor, very authoritarian type shepherding. And it makes us automatically hesitant to believe the best about our leadership. Like they're constantly guilty until they prove themselves innocent. That is entirely unfair to the leadership of any church. God doesn't want the church to behave that way when it comes to accusations against an elder. Do not receive an accusation against an elder is the immediate posture. Now that command, don't receive, is actually much stronger than that. It, it, it even implies, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. That is, don't even let it linger in your mind. Don't think about it. You throw it out. You don't engage with it at all until it's confirmed by two or three witnesses. And let me give a word about what it means to be a witness to an accusation. A witness is a person who has personally experienced or personally observed this elder sinning in this way. A witness is, is not a friend that comes alongside and agrees with another person's observation of, a, of an elder sin. Do you understand what I'm saying there? An accusation, a, a witness, is someone who has personally observed and personally experienced the sin that the elder is being accused of. It is not someone who comes alongside someone who has experienced it and says, yeah, I'll take your side on this. That doesn't qualify as a witness. Witnesses are independent, verifiable observers of sinful behavior in that elder. Now, if there are two to three verifiable witnesses that come forward with a specific accusation and their testimony is credible, then the accusation is to be entertained, it is to be examined, and it is to be evaluated. And if that accusation is then determined by the rest of the elders to be true, then verse 20 tells us exactly what we're to do. Right? We, uh, that elder is to be brought before the entire church, and the other elders are to rebuke that elder publicly so that the rest would stand in fear. This is not the accusers coming and standing before the church to uh, accuse the elder, to make their case against that elder. This is the elders who have done their due diligence and investigated the matter, bringing a sinful elder up before the body in order to rebuke him publicly for his sin. One final thought about church discipline. 
So we've looked at like the general scope of the process, Matthew 18. We've looked at a couple uh, situations where that process is expedited. We've looked at how to handle accusations against an elder. Now I want to end on, on one final thought in relation to church discipline and just stay with me. One final thought. What should the church do if a person who has been placed under discipline is by God's grace brought to repentance? Yeah. Absolutely. Open arms, fully receiving that person. That's right. We see an example of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. I love how complete God's word is, the testimony that the Lord gives us on how to deal with matters. It's astounding. Right? Verse 6, there's a situation where a man had been placed under church discipline. And, and you see that where it says that he was inflicted with punishment by the majority, right? So that's uh, the majority of the church giving their consensus that this man needed to be disciplined out of the church, out of the fellowship of the church. It's what 1 Corinthians 5 was describing. Now notice the punishment was inflicted by the majority. In other words, this was not a decision made by one pastor, this was not even a decision made by the eldership of the church. This is a decision that is made by the whole body of believers. Now, majority does not mean that it had to be unanimous, but it does mean that the majority of the body had to be in agreement on the matter. Very clear statement there. By the way, uh, just to make that even more clear, the church body as a whole is the one who is charged to handle and regulate its membership, not the elders. That's, that has real implications for our Constitution, by the way, how it's worded. So, however, in verse 6, notice this, and we're almost done. Just stay with me. Paul says the punishment inflicted by the majority upon that man is sufficient. What does Paul mean by sufficient? The punishment is sufficient. The punishment is enough. What does that imply? That implies that the punishment has done its work. The goal of church discipline has been reached in relationship to this man. He's been punished by the majority of the church. He's been cast out of the fellowship of the body. And apparently, that worked by God's grace to bring him to repentance. It is sufficient. It's accomplished its end. Its goal is met. Now what is the church to do? Verse 7, Paul says, the punishment is over. The need for the punishment is over. This person has repented. Therefore, you ought to forgive that person. And you ought to comfort that person. Just, just so you're aware of what forgiveness means. What it means to forgive someone. It means that you release that person from the sin that he or she has committed. So when God forgives you for the sake of Christ, He utterly releases you from being accountable to those sins you've committed against Him. Well, we're exhorted in Ephesians 5, aren't we, to be forgiving towards one another in the same way that God and Christ has forgiven us? When someone comes to us who is under church discipline, who is repentant, we are in that moment to be ready and wholeheartedly in agreement with forgiving that person, releasing him or her from any sin that he or she has committed against us. Paul says you ought to forgive that person. You ought to comfort that person lest perhaps such a one would be swallowed up with too much sorrow. You see Paul's concern there for the spiritual well-being of this person. Yes, this person had sinned. Yes, this person sinned so grievously that he was cast out of the church. And yet here and now Paul is showing concern for the well-being of his emotional state. Welcome him, comfort him, so that one of Christ's sheep is not consumed with grief and sorrow. Paul says in verse 8, I urge you, reaffirm your love for him. I urge you, reaffirm your love for him. You see what that's showing us? That's showing us that, that the posture and the heart attitude and the disposition of the church that it is to maintain towards anyone who is under church discipline is one that is willing to show tough love, but always ready to embrace with that love if that person turns in repentance. Yes, it is hard. It is difficult. Church discipline is not anything that anyone wants to go through. 
But the church must maintain a posture that is ready in a single moment to reach out and embrace that person if he or she comes to confess and repent of the sin that he or she has committed. We're not to hold this sin over his head anymore. We're not to shame him in any way for what he has done. There is not to be any penance necessary in order for that person to be restored to the fellowship of the body. Paul says, no, the punishment already inflicted is sufficient. It's already accomplished its work. None of that's necessary. Now, with haste, you must welcome him back and reaffirm your love. See, the church's calling in situations like this is to express the grace of God to that person. So that that person ought to be able to say at the end of that process and after he's been restored, that person ought to be able to say, I can now see how gracious God truly is towards me through the grace that the church has shown me. See, it's our privilege as the people of Christ to show the love of Christ to any returning sinner. Right? I mean, we, we are like the, the father of the prodigal son in that moment, right? We, in that moment that we see this, this sinning member, this brother, this sister of ours turning from sin and turning back to Christ and turning back to us in that moment, just like that father, we take off running towards that person. We embrace that person. We grab a hold of that person lest he turn around and go back to his sin. We bring him home. We throw a party. We rejoice because our brother or sister has been restored to us. That which was lost through excommunication has been found. Restored. That's the goal and that's the aim of all church discipline. And any situation where that is not the goal of church discipline is doing an injustice to the gospel. Anyone who turns from sin and runs to Christ, trusting in his promise to receive them, they will find Jesus' arms open wide and they will find a safe haven where he will bring them in with full acceptance. The church is called to love people that same way, particularly whenever people repent and turn back to Christ from their sin. Now, imperfect as this presentation may have been, I I hope that you see that these are the various aspects of how Jesus calls us as a church body to address sin in our midst and how to deal with difficult situations of conflict. I hope that these will be helpful to us all as we work through a very difficult situation as a body of believers right now. With the light of God's word and the counsel of his spirit, I'm confident that our Lord will lead us right. And his people will be stronger as a result of this current trial. I have no doubt of that. That is my hope that I'm abandoned to it before our God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the testimony of your word. We thank you for how complete and rich and full it is and the guidance that you give us in your word. Please help us, Lord, to trust your process in dealing with these kinds of matters. We we can feel so conflicted by our love for a person, by our sorrow, by our desire to be patient, to to forbear. Lord, we can think that we understand motives better than you do. We, we, We think we can come up with some better way than what you've laid out for us. Please give us grace to have enough faith in you and in your wisdom to walk through difficult and challenging circumstances as a church body according to your word. Lord, we pray that you'd be with us, you'd bless us, fill us with your spirit. We pray for our unity, especially with our brother and sister to be restored. Would you please give us grace, Lord, and and walk with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you hear a benediction from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21? 
Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May you go out believing that the Lord will get glory from his church and from anything else forever and ever. Amen. Amen.